Welcome to The Real Heal, a show featuring real, raw, and authentic conversations between experts in the holistic health space. This is your chance to be a fly on the wall, listening to a 100% organic, unscripted chat about topics in the holistic health world that most aren't even talking about. And believe me, we are holding nothing back. I am your host, Dr. Renee Wallenstein, also known as the Libidoologist, double board certified doc, entrepreneur, as well as healthcare disruptor. I have navigated the traditional world of medicine in overcoming my own personal health obstacles, and I had to take matters into my own hands when the system was failing me. Now I'm shaking things up and sharing my message while collaborating with other experts in my holistic health community to bring you answers to your burning questions about not only getting well naturally, but sustaining that newfound good health. Each week, I will bring you an expert guest, and we will address not only the physical components of optimal health, but also the mental and spiritual influences that will set you up for a long life of limitless energy, self-confidence, and joy, so you can get the real heal for good. So if you're ready, let's get into it. Lena, I am so excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. I was thrilled to be invited. Yes. And uh, we were, my assistant and I were trolling you on Instagram and I thought your (laughs) message was one that really needed to be heard on my platform. Um, And I really thought it was a conversation that we've never had on, on the, on this podcast. Yeah. And I think what what intrigued me is you were talking about fight languages and I'm like, Whoa, what's Mm -hmm. that? Right. So like, we're going to talk about that. Don't you worry. Uh, (laughs) Clearly I love talking about all of this stuff. Yeah. 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 And I love, I just love your whole message. Um, but before we get into it, why don't you tell us who you are and how you got doing what you're doing today? Happily. Uh, so my name is Lena Morgan and I spent over a decade as a midwife, which was actually the perfect training ground for walking people through discovering new parts of themselves and kind of transitioning through to new versions of themselves as well. So at first it was going through a huge transition in my own life away from midwifery and figuring out all right, what am I going to do with my life now? Mm -hmm. I was completely burnt out. PTSD could not function in that sphere anymore. And so, as you well know, the process of walking ourselves through those spaces of like, okay, how am I going to do life now? Mm -hmm. There's so much information there. So I was taking the skills I learned as a midwife of empowering people to trust the wisdom that they have inside Mm -hmm. and then guiding them through the space of welcoming the next version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the fight languages ended up a really easy way to kind of get people in the process, the buy-in to consider, oh, wait, how am I showing up? And is that working for me? And do I want to change any of that? Mm -hmm. I love that. So I'm going to change around my questions because there's lots of things I want to ask you, but let's, let's talk about fight languages. Like, what are they? Like now the audience is intrigued. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued. Like, what are they? Are they useful? Is this something that we can learn from? Totally. So the fight languages are a really easy way to get more information about how you're showing up in conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so powerful to consider as well how you're showing up in a fight or a tense discussion, how your partner might be showing up in that space. And the realization that the way we fight is a protective shield that we're holding up to protect parts of ourselves that have been deeply hurt before. Hmm. So whatever your fight language is, you come by it, honestly, it's there for a good reason. And it served you really well at some point in your life. You might be at a place though, where it's just not working as well for you anymore. And so that's a beautiful place to start figuring out. All right, cool. Why am I doing this? What do I want to be doing instead? How can I show up in conflict in productive ways rather than with the shield raised in a really protective way? Are there names for different fight languages, like the the protective versus the ones where the, yeah, Mm -hmm. tell us all about them. So there's six different fight languages and there are names because I wanted to make this so easy for people to understand. So we have the six kind of emotional types. There's the aggressor, 
there's evasive, there's righteous, there's the victim and the fixer. Mm -hmm. And then I assign them all, um, I don't know, like identities. So the aggressor becomes the general, evasive becomes the magician, the victim becomes the thespian, the withdrawal, sorry, I missed that one, becomes the astronaut and the fixer becomes the mechanic. I got them all. I'm writing as quickly as I can. I was like, I can't miss Good any of this. I'll have the recording. I can go back, but wow. Mm -hmm. So like when you say like the aggressor is the general, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So the general is the person in the conversation that takes charge to bring an immediate resolution. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the skill set they have to do that is a scorched earth. It is a take no prisoner prisoners. This the idea of conflict to them is so unsettling, it's so unsafe that they have to end it immediately. Mm. And so the skill set they have to do that is they'll often say things that they don't actually mean, really harmful things, just to end it. Mm. Or they will explode in anger and be filled with rage, a person that no one in their right mind wants to interact with. Mm -hmm. So they are, you can think of them as the invading army that just comes in and suppresses it mm -hmm. by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. Got it. So they're the, they're the opposite of the aggressor. Is that what I'm hearing? So the general is the aggressor. They okay, are the, the ones okay. that come in and gotcha. just, yep. Aggressively take control. Okay. Mm -hmm. but then do so to shut down because they can't mm -hmm. feel exactly. Okay. Yeah. And we think of our aggressor types, the general as someone that it like almost enjoys conflict, mm -hmm. but in actuality, they are someone who conflict is so threatening that they could never trust the other person to negotiate this conflict in a way that isn't going to cause a lot of harm to them. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Another interesting part that comes in with our aggressors with the general is there's almost always this big shame spiral that happens afterward. So we can have an incredible amount of empathy for these people because they come in, they're like, listen, conflict is crazy unsafe. I will show you how unsafe it can be as I step in and shut it all down. And I'm also going to take on all the responsibility for how badly this ended. Wow. Mm hmm yeah wow. it's like a beautiful terrible way to handle yeah, it absolutely and you know i really wanted to dive into this because you know i work with women libido relationships and a lot of times women don't see their relationship as the reason behind the, their low yeah. libido and they don't understand it's you know i'm all about connection and when you don't feel like mm -hmm. you can connect because of these fight languages right which is why you were so perfect for this for this platform <laughs> is that, you know, like, how do we remedy, remedy, like, so the aggressor, like, mm -hmm. how do we turn that around? Yeah. And so many women will find themselves in relationships as the aggressor. And those that do most often show up as the fixer or mechanic. Mm. So now we have this really beautiful dance that's happening where she's saying, I just want to fix it. I just want to make everything okay. And he's saying, no, you're literally not hearing me. You're kind of steamrolling over my feelings. So now I need to get bigger and bigger and bigger until now so, you hear me. Wow. So there's common patterns between the fight language, like the fight types. So totally. let's, let's dive into the mechanic or the fixer. What are their mm -hmm. personality characteristics or the, the traits of the, of totally. the uh, language? So a lot of people who have recognized themselves as a people pleaser or codependent tend to fall in this fight language. And these are the ones that just even tension in the room is really uncomfortable for them, much less actual conflict. Mm. And their goal is always to stop it. It's unsafe. People can get hurt in this situation. Why would we have conflict when we could just skip ahead to the resolution and calm everything down? So the skills that they have to accomplish this is to control other people's emotions for them. Mm -hmm. So these will be people that are like, no, no, no. I, I think you just misunderstood there. Or no, it's not that you feel like that. It's probably more like this. Mm -hmm. So they can end up explaining people's feelings to them mm -hmm. or making everybody else's emotions smaller 
like, it's just not that big of a deal. Look, if we just X, Y, and Z, you know, Mm -hmm. so everyone around them is feeling more and more unheard and misunderstood and not validated in their experience. And the fixers, they're like, I'm just trying to help. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if we were honest there, we would say, you're not trying to help. You're trying to minimize all conflict to keep everybody safe. Mm. So it comes from a place of love ends up appearing yeah. as trying to make their emotions not be heard or seen mm-hmm. or smaller. Exactly. Um, wow. Yeah. And it's the protective parts. They are trying to protect themselves and everybody else. Wow. So what about the evasive or the magician? Mm-hmm. So everybody has at least one magician in their life and they are the person that deploys sarcasm or gets on a philosophical soapbox about it. You know, you start with this conversation here and you end up 10 miles away, still trying to engage with them, but they are just going in all these different directions or they might be the version of the magician that turns it around on themselves. Mm. Oh, so it's all my fault then, I guess, you know, they're really can deftly move the conversation around off of the original topic. And our evasive people are the ones that feel like when they're in the spotlight, if it's their fault, the blame and the consequences are going to be high enough that it is worth doing everything they can to make sure they're not at fault. Mm. Yeah, I'm hearing right now, even getting into the third, can people be a combination of different Such a good question. Yeah, this comes up all the time. And if you take the quiz on my website, then you get percentages of your fight languages. So you're going to have a main one. I like thinking of them as layers that stack Mm -hmm. up around our inner shield or our inner wound. So you have your first main shield. This Mm -hmm. is probably how you're going to show up in most conflicts, most spots of tension. And then if we move past that, you're going to get to a different shield. And so maybe you start with the aggressor Mm -hmm. and your next shield is withdrawal. Mm -hmm. You just, you're gone. You're the astronaut. You have left the room. Maybe you start with the fixer. And if people are not willing to fix things, you move into the thespian, you go into victim mode. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to help. Nobody Mm -hmm. ever cares about me. Mm -hmm. You know, when you like crumple up as the tiny baby deer that now someone needs to come take care of, you know, you taking care of them didn't work. So now let's see if they'll take care of you. I love that. So yeah. I, and I want to just preface this by saying, like, I can hear myself in some of these myself, you know, like, (laughs) you know, and, and, and so I just, for the audience, like, this is not to be critical. This is just awareness. Like I'm all about awareness. And like, if there's a way we're showing up that we don't necessarily want to show up anymore. It's great mm-hmm. to have these tools to be able to say, oh my gosh, that's totally what I do and mm-hmm. raise awareness around it. That's my primary shield. That's right behind it. Yep. If that mm-hmm. doesn't happen, I love it. And then perhaps we can talk about like what to do about some of these, but yeah. And I know it's only an hour podcast. We can't go solving everyone's life, <laughs> life issues, but we'll do our mm-hmm. best. So let's, let's, um, touch on the, the victim, the thespian. Mm-hmm. Yep, totally. So the victims get a bad rap because it's really easy to write them off as a drama queen, as, you know, the martyr, as someone who we have like all of these societal words to attach to them that totally disempower them. Mm -hmm. But here is the beauty of the thespian is they are the one of the fight languages that is most in touch with their emotions. Mm. So they do such a great job of having access to their emotions and being able to articulate them that unfortunately the people around them who maybe aren't able to do that as well can feel like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how I feel. So I need to make you feel bad about all of these emotions. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the more protective side of the thespian is that unfortunately they can get really in the deep end with their emotions it's hard to kind of keep it in check or in perspective or include other people in the experience. It's really about them. They're Mm -hmm. on center stage. And until they feel like their experience has been validated, Mm -hmm. they're going to stay front and center. Mm. Wow. I'm sure that hits home a little bit. Maybe it's someone's fourth (laughs) shield, right? But what about righteous? What was righteous? The other name for righteous? Uh, The attorney. 
attorney. Yeah. So um, a lot of men tend to fall into this category too, um, or women who are really embodying their masculine can find themselves using this fight language effectively. Uh, and with the attorney, it's all about the facts. Mm -hmm. So these are the people that want you to bring receipts. They want you to cite sources. They want you to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. And if there is any doubt, then it's null and void. So these are people that can be so challenging in their protective space because they are looking for any flaws in your argument. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when we're in a fight, we're never in our best, most logical place. Mm -hmm. So that's something that the attorney can always use to their advantage. I will find a flaw in your argument. And once I do, I've proven it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. Whereas when they're in their more uh, productive you know, the productive attorney is someone that keeps us on topic. They don't let us get too far in the weeds. They make sure things are fair and balanced, which is an amazing thing to have in a discussion where maybe things are a little more tense. Wow. These are all <laughs> making so much sense. And then the last, I think, yeah, the last one we haven't covered yet is withdrawal, which mm -hmm. I mean, what was the other name for that one? The astronaut. Astronaut. I should have. Yeah. So these, this is a fight language that shows up in most people's layers of shields, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it's the ripcord that you pull to get out of the conflict. And even though a lot of people that have this as like their first fight language, their main fight language can often feel like what powerful. No, I feel overwhelmed. I feel totally powerless. I feel like I have nothing that I can do here except leave. Mm -hmm. When in reality, this is an incredibly powerful fight language because it effectively puts the brakes on the conflict and everything stops. Mm -hmm. So in their productive fighting style, you know, when they're showing up with the productive version of themselves, this is so helpful. This is when we say, you know, things are starting to get a little tense. Maybe we should take a break. Just take 20 minutes. Let's regroup. We'll come back and talk about this again. Mm. But in their protective style, any sort of conflict has them just shutting down. Mm -hmm. So they might physically shut down inside mm -hmm. of themselves. They've gone in their brain. They're not engaging with you. Good luck to try and get them back in that discussion. Or they might shut down by leaving. They've gotten in the car and driven away. They've left the house. Mm. It's, I have like so much empathy for both the astronaut that's like, things are so unsafe. I have to physically leave before someone gets hurt. Mm -hmm. And the person that's in the conflict with them, that's like, well, now I'm just holding all of this by mm -hmm. myself. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's so hard. Wow. These, I, I'm sure everyone can resonate with a couple of these, um, especially mm -hmm. when you visualize yourself in conflict, so like wh what mm -hmm. comes out for you now, how, where do we even begin to remedy this? Like, so say like we've now mm -hmm. raised awareness around each of these different emotions, emotion types or, or fight languages, mm -hmm. where do we even begin to start breaking down that, taking that shield down? Totally. So it might be counterintuitive, but it is almost easier to see the fight language in somebody else before you start identifying with it in yourself. Mm -hmm. Because you've certainly been on the receiving end of mm -hmm. every single one of mm -hmm. these six different fight languages. And so if we're looking at someone else, we're looking at a parent, we're looking at a spouse, we're looking at a close friend and seeing how they show up in arguments and knowing enough of their life to know why this is a protective shield that makes a lot of sense for them. Mm -hmm. When it's outside of us, it is a lot easier to see, you know? Mm -hmm. So with that thought, you can say, okay, yeah, I can see the household that they grew up in. Mm -hmm. and how the consequences of not showing up the way someone wanted you to were so severe mm -hmm. that withdrawing and literally leaving the situation, yeah, that would have made a lot of sense for them. Mm -hmm. And so I can see that this person now, as they've grown and they've gone through the world, you know, anyone that's done inner child work has that recognition, mm -hmm. but that hurt part of us still there, mm -hmm. always there. You know, mm -hmm. 
a really informative part of us that we bring forward. So with empathy, we can see like, oh, my spouse was raised in this childhood, had this really smart response. They have come forward in life. That wounded inner part of them is afraid of being hurt like that again. So great. They have that protective shield come up. Okay. So that lets us realize their shield is not about us, Mm -hmm. you know, and that Mm -hmm. is really the first step to having, I call it the 10,000 foot view, you know, where you come Mm -hmm. up and you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I was just seeing things right here. And it was really confusing and intense. And I didn't even know where to start pulling the thread on all of this. But as I come up from up here, I can see why my spouse does this. All right. What about me? And sometimes we can ask other people for feedback, like, how does it feel to be in a conflict with me? Which, I mean, all the gold stars, if you do that, because that is a vulnerable space to expand into, you know, you might hear things you don't want to. (laughs) Don't ask your teenager, because they're going to say all six, right? They're going to be like, well, you do this and you do that. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) teenagers are very real and raw. Exactly. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. No, I have a 12 year old and she has no problem telling me like, you do realize that you're doing this right now. right? Like, and again, we're only oof. human, right? Like, <laughs> and I, I mean, I think, I think they're, um, they're really difficult to avoid, but I, again, like you said, you know, identifying them, raising awareness, and then trying to just see where it's coming from, because mm-hmm. you do sound like evolution of some sort of coping mechanism or, yes. um, defect, you know, coping scale, defense mechanism, whatever Mm -hmm. from our past that we've developed. Um, and you, and you may not know what that is, right? Like some people are not forthcoming or they don't even know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could absolutely be that, you know, whatever the inner wound is that they're protecting is they're so afraid of having that hurt Mm -hmm. that it doesn't even make sense for them to really have an awareness of it yet until they feel like, oh, okay, I could protect myself in more healthy ways. Mm -hmm. So that's what I remind everyone when we're talking about the fight languages is that they're really smart responses to a situation where you got really hurt in life. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't make any sense to tell somebody like, well, just stop doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what now I'm just supposed to walk around with this huge wound inside of me and no way to protect it. Mm -hmm. So instead let's start from a place where we're starting to be curious Mm -hmm. about the wounds where we're starting to be thoughtful about what is it when I show up with this fight language, how do I want someone to respond to me in that situation? Mm -hmm. What is it that I'm really asking for here? Mm -hmm. You know, like the general is asking for someone to stop fighting with them. They don't have a way to do it. That's not aggressive and over the top yet. The thespian is asking for someone to acknowledge their emotions Mm -hmm. and they don't have a way to do that. That's not dramatic and increasing in the emotion until it's recognized. The astronaut wants someone to stop the conflict for them. And their best way to do it is to leave, Mm. to escape. So each one of the fight languages, we're doing it for a really smart reason. And until we have something else to put in place of it, there is no way that I'm saying stop fighting like that. Mm -hmm. But if we start to be curious about how we're fighting, There's so many more productive ways that we can start engaging in conflict. I love that. I love that. Um, And then you said you have a quiz. So the quiz will give you Mm -hmm. your primary shield and. It goes through all of them. Yeah. So it gives you the percentage on each one of the shields. So you might be like 40% one, 10% another, 2% this and none of the other three. Yeah. And do you give any, um, tips as far as Mm -hmm. so the quick info you get with your quiz results is for your main fight language you get one of the productive traits and one of the protective traits just to give you a little bit more information and then you can choose to download the fight language quick guide that's on the website and that gives you a full page on each of the fight languages okay we'll be sure to make sure that's in the show notes if it doesn't make it right on apple or whatever it'll be on the website um Mm -hmm. have you written a book yet (laughs) 
<laughs> we're in the process of it right now. <laughs> okay. Cause I'm like, this is a great book because I mean, to go through each of them and then potentially how, like you said, make it more productive versus protective yes. would be great because it just, yeah. I think it would help a lot of couples out there um, start on their own. And obviously I know you work with, with people as well. Mm-hmm. So we'll get to that at the end, but like for those that want to try to do it themselves or start that, you know, the awareness process before getting to yes. you, I think it'd be great. So we'll be looking, yeah. I'll have you back <laughs> on the show for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Admittedly, this whole thing, uh, was a bit more of a rocket ship than we were expecting. My husband and I have been working, you know, in the emotional healing field for a few years now. And you know, had some progress and then articulated the fight languages. And we're like, oh, we realize so many people that we've been working with. And also like we come from career fields where you're getting people on one of the most stressful days of their life. He was a firefighter and EMT. I was a midwife. He became a psych nurse. You know, I was working with people one-on-one. So we both, it was like, oh yeah, we know exactly the different fight languages and how people are using them. So yeah, no, when this <laughs> took off on social media, it was like, oh, all right, let's go on this ride now. Yeah, I know. No. And I think you articulate it very well as far as the different types. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, we can, we can be aware that we are a certain way in fights or not. But I think, mm-hmm. like you said, articulating, putting a name to it and like identifying like, oh, like anchoring to it. I'm like, yep, that's yes. what it is. It just gives yeah. it a little more of a structure. And then mm-hmm. again, so how can we, you know, make it less protective and more productive, it, but also tapping into like, why, you know, why mm-hmm. is it my protective shield and mm-hmm. maybe start some of that healing too. So Absolutely. And that is one of the most powerful things we can do with parts of ourselves that we haven't really had awareness of before Mm -hmm. is we can identify it and make it outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when you recognize Mm -hmm. yourself in a fight language where you're like, oh, the magician, that is me. Mm -hmm. Suddenly when you're in a conflict and you notice yourself doing it, you have a name to put it. Ah, there Mm -hmm. I am. I'm being evasive again. And yep, I'm going to choose to go ahead and keep doing that right now because I literally have no idea how to handle this otherwise, Mm -hmm. but the amount of awareness you've brought. So maybe six fights down the road, you could actually verbalize to the other person. You know, I can tell I'm being evasive right now. I have no idea how to handle this instead, but I'm at least going to own that part. And like, maybe we can return to this conversation in a bit. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that because I think so (laughs) many other women in my world, they're already stressed, overwhelmed. And if we come on this interview today and say, okay, this is you, but now you have to do this <laughs> in your next fight. Totally. You're be like, Whoa, I am not ready for that. So I, I love that. It's like That's awareness so each time you're in that conflict and you're like, Oh, there she is. Oh, there she is again. Oh, there she yes. is. again. It's mm-hmm. like, like you said, it makes it a little less, um, a little more clinical, like, okay, there it mm-hmm. is. Like I see it. And yep. then eventually gets to a point where like, okay, at the seventh fight, now maybe I'm ready to take the first steps to yeah. figure out how to not be so evasive or, um, yeah. or aggressive, you know, aggressive. Totally. So I, I love that. I, th- I love how you just are really tuned into the fact that a lot of people are not programmed to make that three, you know, 180 yeah. shift overnight. Totally. And so much when we talk about engaging in conflict and fights, what we're talking about more than anything is shame. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to talk to people about a space where I know they're already feeling a lot of shame, if I'm adding shame to that, then all I'm doing is confirming that the way they show up in arguments is hurting other people. Mm -hmm. So they are feeling shame about that. The way they're doing it is harming themselves. Mm -hmm. It is causing more disconnection in their relationships. Like all, there is so much judgment that gets placed in those spaces. Mm -hmm. So if, if the only thing we do is say that we're all entering into conflict, we're doing it for really smart reasons. And we're bringing up protective shields to keep us from getting hurt the way we have in the past. Like that's enough awareness to say Mm -hmm. like, okay, maybe I'm doing that. And maybe one day I'll be able to be more curious when my bucket is not so full of other things I'm working on. I love that. And you know, that takes away that potentially starts not even that necessarily hundred percent taking away, but starts chipping at that guilt and shame that they feel, which we know is like a negative, you know, low frequency, low vibe emotion that 
mm-hmm. it will affect our health over time. Like that guilt and that shame that we feel all the time after a conflict, it's like, it's how we showed up and then how we walked away from it. It's a, a double, double whammy. So like, I just, yeah, I mm-hmm. love that. You know, we start chipping away at that, that emotion connected to that conflict that, and also mm-hmm. how we engage in that conflict. So I, I just, yeah, I love, Absolutely. I love it. And that's the work that I do with women is called story healing. So it's about healing the generational stories that were passed down and you received without really any awareness of. And it's exactly what I'm doing with women in that sphere as well Mm -hmm. to say like, listen, you're having a really smart story come up to protect fears that you have. So Mm -hmm. if we can see it as like, oh, I have a story that I don't matter. I know I react to it. My reaction feels like this suddenly we can recognize it. Ah, that was actually my mom's story. That was actually something that had nothing to do with me. And we can start to have some distance from those things that just felt like core parts of ourselves before that. And the same with the fight language, the way you've been showing up in conflict and causing disconnection, suddenly, oh, that was a really smart thing. It worked really well for me when I was a kid. I don't live in that house anymore. I can choose to show up in different ways now. Wow. So powerful. Like I just, (laughs) like, this has been, this is brilliant. That's why I'm like, I have to have her on because this is just brilliant. Like anything that myself or my audience that we can just like, like I said, anchor to and like, oh yes. Yep. And then that's it. And, and now, you know, raise awareness and we can start healing that eventually, you know, on our Mm -hmm. own, on our own terms, but, um, truly. What is the difference between your intuitive voice and your inherited voice? I love this question so much. So this is one of the key foundational parts of figuring out what is a story that you inherited or what is a coping skill that you've taken along with you in this lifetime is to discover what your intuitive voice feels like in your inherited voice. So your inherited voice is a belief about yourself that was given to you by someone that came before you. So this is something you were told about yourself by a parent. This is something that um, someone in your core group around you as a kid told you was a way we have to show up as a human. It was something that a coach said offhandedly one time and you recorded as a core truth about you. So when it comes to our our inherited voice, it feels like anxiety. Mm. And so when you think of those things that, well, my mom always said this, or yep, I'm just a person that does that. Check where you feel that in your body. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, it'll feel like a tightness in their chest, maybe a rock in their stomach. They'll feel their shoulders get tight. So we can't really logic with these voices, but we can start to communicate with them. And the first place is discovering where they live inside of us. Mm -hmm. So having an idea of your inherited voice is now personifying anxiety, you know, versus our intuitive voice, which is what we know to be true for us. Without anyone else's judgment, opinion, you know, voice on top of it, it is simply what is true for us. And it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. Mm -hmm. So when we think of our intuition, some people will have an amazing sense of what it feels like to get an intuitive ping and then act on it. And then a lot of people will have no idea what their intuition feels like. Mm -hmm. So I generally start with something like somebody asks you to do something and you don't want to do it. How does that feel in your body? You know, does that feel like I should, do I have a good reason not to? And then we're going to step to the other side that says, you know, you don't want to do it. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. How does that feel in your body? And, you know, you can like feel your shoulders relax and your stomach unwind. That's your intuition. That is the knowing that again, doesn't have to be signed off on by Mm -hmm. anyone else, you know, and that's enough. So as you're doing all of this work where you're like discovering parts of yourself that might have been really up on the top shelf in a box that you didn't want to look at, a great tool to navigate through that space is just checking in to see how it feels in your body. 
-hmm. And that's going to give you an enormous amount of information. Is this actually something old that I chose to take on as a belief? Is this an inherited thing that actually has nothing to do with me? And I could maybe set it down. Mm -hmm. What would that look like if I set it down? What other truths might come in instead? I love that. I love that. And I love, you know, the fact that you just bring it back to just tuning into your body because actually it's two comments I want to make. Number one, we're mm -hmm. so disconnected with our body. So I love that you're just like, bring it back mm -hmm. in, like be present in the moment. How does that feel? And number two, you know, we all have that intuitive voice. It's just, I feel like a lot of us, and this was me until about mm, eight, nine years ago because of my profession and, and my upbringing, it was so muted. Yeah. yeah, I had so many of those inherited voices in my head. I didn't know that I even had intuition until I got that first ping in my gut. And I'm like, yeah, what is that? And because I slowed down, I was present enough to recognize it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I could trust it yet, but I'm like, what is that? And so, you know, everyone has it. It's just a matter of whether or not we're practicing listening to it. And, and, yeah. and like you said, um, knowing what's true for us versus something that we have been told is our truth. Mm -hmm. And that is, I mean, that is empowerment right there. That mm -hmm. is when you decide I'm actually going to keep my power for myself rather than give it to someone else and what they say I should do or what they say I should feel that you're keeping that power in, you know, which is a beautiful place to walk through the world because suddenly we don't have to react to everything mm -hmm. that's being said. Mm -hmm. We know what's true for us. We can literally sit back and say like, oh, I believe that is true for you, but I'm not going to take that on for me. Mm -hmm. I love that. So again, most of us, what we believe about ourselves are the stories we've been told. So how do mm -hmm. we come to that term of discovering for ourselves, what is our truth? What is more true? Yep. The first place we start is empathy. Mm -hmm. So if we can have maybe curiosity is before empathy, but gosh, they are right there mm -hmm. <laughs> tied to each other. If we can have curiosity for someone else's experience. So say your mom had a lot of stories about her body that she inherited from someone as well. And she passed those on to you. She did it out of love and out of protection but they really never worked for you. Mm -hmm. So now we can have a lot of empathy for why your mom might have made it a top priority for you to be a specific size that would be most socially accepted. And when we have empathy for her, we're literally like removing it from our body and handing it back to her mm -hmm. to say like, I know you did this with love. It never felt like that to me. I'm not going to choose to carry this story forward. I'm going to give it back to you where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And she could choose to turn around and give it back to the person that handed it to her. That is always an option. But if we can have curiosity and empathy for the stories we were given or the ways we handle conflict with the fight languages, 90% of the time I can ask someone how their parents fought and they will have embodied one of their parents' fight languages. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, you were really smart. You looked around it. How can we handle conflict? And you said, that person looks more in power or safer. So I'm going to go with them. Mm -hmm. So now you can have that understanding. Oh, I fight the way my mom did because my dad looked really unsafe. So I picked up her fight language. Mm -hmm. That was maybe never how I handled conflict at all. Like, that's her. Okay. So if I give that back to her, now I'm really curious. If I don't do that, how do I handle conflict? Mm -hmm. I love that. You know, I feel like part of this is generational too. Like when we start identifying and working on our, our own stories and our fight languages and our emotions and our mm -hmm. inherited voices, like in recognizing ours, perhaps those of us with children. So again, I have teenagers, yeah. um, that witness probably conflict, um, and taking on our fight languages as their conflict of their fight languages, mm -hmm. and, you know, perhaps the earlier we identify and start the process, perhaps that will help them along the way. I don't know. Totally. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because here's the main thing that most people, when we're parenting, we're uncomfortable with conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, we're uncomfortable with having conflict. We're uncomfortable in that space where things are tense and unresolved. Me, most of all, I am a classic fixer. I want like, just tell me what I can do and I will do it. And we can stop Mm -hmm. all of this. Mm -hmm. But showing my children that like, yep, things are tense right now and they feel really uncomfortable. Here's what I want to do. I want to just like, how can I make this okay? But I trust that we will be able to find a resolution that feels okay for everybody. And we might not be able to do it right in this moment. Like you can, as you're walking your kids through this, Mm -hmm. you are literally walking yourself Mm -hmm. through it as well. You know? And one of the, like, because my work is so generational, one of the most profound things I found was considering that we can tell our kids that you, you deserve to have your voice heard. Mm -hmm. You deserve to show up in conflict in healthy ways. You deserve to be understood in your experience. But if we don't embody that ourselves, then what our kids learn is when you're a kid, all of these things are true and you deserve to have your experience validated. Mm -hmm. But when you're an adult, they are not true. Mm -hmm. So the only way we can like help shape the adult version of themselves Mm -hmm. is to embody it, to literally show them, here's how you can be an adult in the world. Mm -hmm. And they will find their own beautiful version of that. They will take what you give them and run it forward in new and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. But that is what motivates me a lot in my work to show up differently is I am showing my children, like there is an adult version of you that could be like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not right. to put more pressure on things. <laughs> yeah, no. And I don't think we're saying like, you're never going to have conflict. I think it's just, mm-hmm. you know, you don't get any resolution of the conflict if, if we repetitively mm-hmm. exert these different fight languages, you know, a lot of times, you know, one walks away and one's trying to put a bandaid on it, you know, like there, mm-hmm. nothing gets resolved. So I think that's what we're, we're coming full circle to say conflict's going to happen. Yep. Right. We're, we're going to have disagreements. It's just, how do we enter that disagreement to make it the most productive use of our time yes. and get uh-huh. to a resolution of the conflict versus just two angry people walking away and feeling guilt and shame. Yep. Totally. And the consideration that most conflicts don't actually need a resolution. Mm. Most of the time, all we need is to feel heard and understood in our experience We don't actually need someone to do something differently. We just need to, you know, we are showing up and fighting to have someone understood how that felt to us. Mm. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's that's absolutely correct. Absolutely. Right. When you think of all the, you know, just think back of the last five arguments you had, was it really a conflict or is it just, you wanted to be heard and it was a competition of who yelled louder, who walked away first. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's why you can shift so dramatically how you're having conflict to have that awareness that like, the problem is not even the other person. The problem is I don't feel heard. Mm -hmm. So then we get into this whole very interesting part where it's like, okay, tell me how you're listening to yourself then. Mm. I love that. Oh my goodness. We could talk forever. I cannot wait for the book to come out by the way. Like I no pressure, no pressure, but I know it's going to be like, you are so powerful in this interview and, and, you know, I don't know how you even say it. Like you're very articulate on these different met, you know, different languages. And, and I think we can all see it. In other words, we can see us in them. And I think it's Mm -hmm. really powerful you identifying, but then how to come out the other side Mm -hmm. of of these fight languages. Oh, for sure. We can do like a whole second podcast on like how, you know, if this is your fight language, how do you navigate conflict in productive ways? Or if you recognize your partner's fight language, how do you navigate conflict in ways that understand where their, what their need is Mm -hmm. underneath their expression? Wow. We have two and three. We have part two and part three coming (laughs) because I think it's powerful. I think, I think you could save a lot of relationships just because of the communication piece and the misidentification of, of how they're coming into this conflict. And I think, 
they're not going to need half the therapy after they read your book and, and just <laughs> identify, maybe some will, maybe 25% yeah. still will, but like, I'm just saying, like, I think a lot of it is just this miscommunication and, and unable to identify that this is going on. And once you get to that identification part and awareness part, it's, it's just the work you have to put in to try to yeah. better understand your partner and, and start working on your own emotions. But Absolutely. Yeah. So, so good. Um, last question I always end mm-hmm. on because my listeners always want to know from the experts, what's one thing that you know now that you wish you knew five or 10 years ago? You can't mess anything up. If I had that five or 10 years ago, I would have saved myself so much angst and worry and self judgment that you can't do anything to mess it up. All you can do is move forward with the information you have at the time, making a thoughtful, kind decision. And as you gather more information, you can look back at it with empathy and say like, oh yeah, I would handle that different now, but I'm a different person now. Mm -hmm. So of course I would. And it's always a lesson learned, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so I would do that. I would do that differently now, but yeah. I always say, did someone die? Hopefully not. Like it's not, it's it right. felt like a big deal in the moment, but really it wasn't. So yeah. Yep. Exactly. So mm-hmm. I'm sure my audience is going to be like, oh my gosh, where is she? Where can we find her? <laughs> so where do you like to hang out, especially on social media? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your website, of course we will list it, but, um, how do you Perfect. work with, with others? Just tell us yeah. all, all the details. <laughs> Great. So, um, One of the powerful things we do is we do workshops that are either online or in person about the fight languages. So we do them for couples, which are incredible. We had somebody tell us it was like going to fight school to learn how to fight better with their partner. And then we also do them for individuals because fighting is not limited to partnership. We have conflict with our parents at work with a cohort, you know, just like everywhere. So then we also do one-on-one sessions, both my husband, JP and I, um, with couples, which is really powerful because everybody feels heard. Mm -hmm. Everybody feels understood in that. Um, And so we have what we call like triage appointments where you're like, listen, we are in so much, like, this is the worst right now. Great. We can sit down with you for an hour and we can at least get you pointed in a new direction Mm -hmm. or we have the long-term care. We're Mm -hmm. all right let's, you know, you can, it's like couples coaching. We're going to walk you through this. We're going to find a different version of your relationship. So I do the same thing with women. He does the same thing with men working with them one-on-one for more like life coaching, uh, expertise and guidance. Um, you can always find me on the website, easy to get a hold of there. And that has all of our upcoming workshops and events and more information about the one-on-one or the a couple sessions. And then I am on all the social media platforms and I have a Patreon that's starting very soon. Perfect. So you'll be able to have more of the like one-on-one connection on there. But yeah, on social media, there's an incredible amount of content with more information. So that's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And again, that's where I found you on Instagram. So, um, so there was a lot <laughs> awesome. of information because I was like, Oh, look at this. We need to talk more about this. So I love that. And you do have awesome. a workshop coming up. Is that correct? At the end of March? Yes. At the end so- of March, March 25th, that's an online couples workshop. And then at the end of April, we have an online individual workshop. I love that. Yeah. So we'll make sure mm-hmm. if we don't have the links, they can go to your website and get them, but yep. Um, totally. definitely if you liked what you heard today, you know, and that's a nice little place to start at like triaging you and working with you and, and mm-hmm. see how that goes. Yep. So, uh, and then yeah. obviously be on the lookout for her book, which I'll, again, yes. I promise <laughs> I'll have her back on when your book comes out. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I adore I, that. Thank you so much for being here and, um, just, you know, changing the conversation around fighting and just giving us a little more perspective and giving us hope. <laughs> that mm. we can come out the other side for sure. better than we went in. We're all moving forward. So whatever path it is that makes sense for you, there is space to move forward. Love that. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Real Heal and that you learned something new. And before you go, can you do me a quick favor? Take a screenshot right now and share it to Instagram and tag me so I can celebrate 
you for taking action and improving your health. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please take a minute to leave me a rating and a quick review. This will help others just like you find the show. And do not forget to subscribe because you will not want to miss out on any of the amazing guest experts that I have coming up very soon. And remember, it's not selfish to take care of yourself. Do one thing today that makes you happy and learn to love life again. And with that, I'm out of here. Talk to you again soon.